a lot of information that we'll be sharing in this in this Facebook Live. So thank you, Ilya, for taking the time. And I want to start by asking you just to share a little bit about yourself and uh, what made you decide to become an SLP. Yes. So um, as you said, my name is Ilya Nexi Santini, but people call me Ilya, obviously, because it's easier. <laughs> um, I am a bilingual speech language pathologist. I am currently working at Ascent Rehab Services, Inc., specifically in the clinic setting. Um, I am providing, I am doing assessments and providing treatment to a variety of patients there with a variety of communication delays and disorders. Disorders. Um, I am also an assistive technology um, and AAC specialist. So I am also providing AAC, which stands for Augmentative Alternative Communication Consultations to a variety of professionals. Um, and um, I am also doing bilingual, school based bilingual assessments around the Bay Area. So those are basically my areas of interest, uh, bilingualism or linguistically and culturally diverse populations, AAC, um, and also feeding um, as well. Um, and then, honestly, I was not my initial thought was not being an SLP, <laughs> uh, but after several years, I just started seeing different SLPs, different SLPAs, and I was like, huh, I like this. I actually like this um, because I like to interact with people. I like communication. I love talking <laughs> with people. I love cultures. Um, I love science. And then I figured out or I realized SLP, being an SLP was the perfect fit for me. Um, and once I started, honestly, during my first class, I fell in love with the profession. And I'm still in love with the profession. I really love my profession. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful when you love what you do, right? I mean, yes. That's that's the best uh, that we can do, and it brings out the best in us when we are working as well, and especially the kind of work that you do. Uh, so, what exactly does an SLP do? Right, I know you mentioned a little bit about it, but in what kind of what do they do, and what kind of settings do they work? Yes. Okay. So, speech language pathologist has a wide scope of practice, um, I would say, um, and then it is mainly divided within speech and language. Um, mm -hmm. So let's start with speech. Speech is also subdivided in fluency, articulation, and voice. So articulation is when an in, we work with a, right, we work on articulation when an individual is um, having difficulty to motorically produce um, speech sounds. Um, so for example, bilabial sounds such as b, Mm, uh, nasal sounds such as m mm or n, mm, alveolar sounds such as d, t, uh, or maybe uh, the patient has a lisping, right? So we work with children so they can produce speech sounds. Um, in voice, we also work with people that have um, organic patho organic or acquired pathologies in their vocal cords that are affecting their voice parameters, uh, which are tone uh, or pitch, sorry, volume, um, speech, um, volume, pitch, um, and quality of voice. Um, so we help them to improve those parameters of voice, um, so they can so they can improve the speech intelligibility, um, etc. And in voice, voice is an area that we always collaborate with other kind of professionals, such as an ENT, uh, because mo it mostly involves other other professionals to perform a surgery, etc. And then we have um, fluency of speech. And then here we have the kids and the, the adults that have stuttering or cluttering um, and they are exhibiting different disfluencies in their speech. For example, word repetitions, for example, my, my apple, um, 
sound repetitions, for example, a, a, apple, or sound prolongations, for example, apple. And then these, these fluencies are um, affecting the speech intelligibility. Um, so we and not only the speech intelligibility, also the individual as a person, the mental health as well. So we work uh, with these kids that are um, evidencing stuttering or cluttering, which is when a person speaks very, very fast, and then it's very hard to understand him or her. So those are the areas of speech. Then we have language, which is also divided in five components. So we have children that have uh, problems with morphology, which, have, which include the different parts of speech, for example, or of language, for example. Um, the individual can have problems with plurals or can have problems with um present progressive verbs, for example, the ing verbs such as in running or with personal pronouns, etc. So we work on that. And we also work with children that have syntactic problems, which means how they are organizing um, the words in a sentence. For example, we say, we say the red apple. We don't say apple, red, the, right? So when children or individuals or so adults that, um, that have difficulty with syntactic rules, we can just help them to improve those syntactic rules as well. Um, semantics, which is another component of language. Um, and then in this part, we focus on vocabulary, increasing the words that this patient understand and that this patient says or use. Uh, or uses. So basically, those are mostly the components of language, but we also have social communication or pragmatics, and we can't forget that component because it's very important. And then that means how you use language to socially interact with other people. Okay. Um, we also have phonology, which is how we combine sounds in a word, combine sounds to make words uh, according to the phonotactic rules of the language that the individual speaks. So as you see, <laughs> the scope of a speech language pathology is very, very broad. I just defined or just um, be more, uh, was more specific regarding speech and language but speech language pathologists also work on feeding skills and swallowing skills. Um, we also work on augmentative alternative communication. Um, and there are some SLPs that also work with um, oral rehab rehabilitation for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing um, and cognitive aspects of language such as executive functions, et cetera. So honestly, our scope is very, very broad. <laughs> wow. I had no idea how broad that was and how many things it covers, right? Like everything from feeding and swallowing to all the language and speech, um, uh, you know, the, how you distilled on the, all the information of um, how wide the scope is and how broadly it serves serves uh, people who are helped by SLPs. So what kind of training do SLPs go through? Like what kind of training um, do you have to go through to become an SLP? Yes. Okay. So in order to become an SLP first, the individual has to complete a bachelor's degree program. Honestly, um, SLPs, um, come from different areas. So some of SLPs made their bachelor's degree in psychology or in a different area. However, if you haven't started this path and if you want to become an SLP, it is recommended to make a bachelor's degree in communication disorders or communication sciences, um, language development, maybe education, etc. cetera. Um, after that, um, the individual has to do a mass speech language pathology master's degree. 
in an accredited um, program by ASHA, which is the American Speech Language Hearing Association here in the United States. Um, after that, or well, in the in during the master's degree, um, the individuals also have to complete a clinical practicum, and they have to complete certain amount of time. Um, then, in some countries, honestly, this part depends on the country where the person lives. Um, the person has to complete a clinical fellowship year um, and the person needs to be supervised by an SLP um, who has their CCCs, um, which is the Certificate of Clinical Competence, um, for a year. That part is just to have or just to try to achieve as most knowledge as possible after the individual graduated. Um, and basically, <laughs> that's the process. Obviously, you have to do the process of, of acquiring um, or of being licensed in the state where you want to work. Um, and after that, because our profession or our scope it's so broad um some SLPs decide to specialize in a certain area so after you are an SLP you have the option of specializing in a specific area it could be feeding it could be um AAC autism etc um, and in order to continue being an SLP we have to complete certain um, certain uh, like education units um, so we can maintain our license updated and our knowledge updated as well because things change <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we have to keep updated regarding um, diagnosis, treatment, etc. Yeah so do you also have a specialization that you practice for yourself? <laughs> Yes, so right now, um, because my areas of interest are augmentative alternative communication, um, feeding, and bilingualism, um, since my primary language is Spanish, I am, um, I am an AAC specialist. I completed a certificate course in AT, assistive technology, and I have completed different CEUs courses in AAC. So I call myself an AAC specialist. Um, I am also trained in culturally and linguistically diverse um, topics um, because I like to work with different individuals from different cultures and different languages. Um, and I like to assess a specifically Hispanic um, population, which honestly, it's kind of hard here in California and in the United States because there are not enough bilingual SLPs. Um, and I am also trained in SOS, which is a feeding approach. So because those are my areas of, um, I would say my favorite areas in my scope, I decided to complete more CEU courses and certificate courses in those areas so I can acquire more knowledge um, and I can serve the population I like to serve. Okay. And and I know you mentioned that there is there are not enough bilingual SLPs, but what about or other otherwise is it a shortage of SLPs in general or is it just more in bilingual field there is a shortage a shortage of SLPs in general <laughs> monolingual and bilingual SLPs in the United States and also in other countries and this is due to different factors uh, for example one factor is that autism rates are raising um, another factor is that um, the universities that offer the speech language pathology program um, just accept a limited amount of individuals per year. For example, the university where I completed my master's degree, um, that university just accepts 15 individuals per year. So that means that 
like once a year, you just have 15 SOPs to serve a whole country. Um, and then another um, thing is that um, it's a lot of <laughs> work, like, you know, a lot of preparation um, to become an SLP. So right now there are more online programs out there in order to facilitate the process of being an SLP and to see if we can have more SLPs to serve our populations. Mm -hmm. um, what do you find most rewarding about being an SLP? That's a hard question. <laughs> That's a hard question. Uh, but I think I what I like or enjoy the most is seeing the progress on my patients, um, creating meaningful relationships with my patients and their families. Um, I love receiving text messages and emails from them telling me, oh, my kiddo said mama today, or my kiddo <laughs> said a complete Aww. sentence. Um, he said, I want milk and things like that. So I love receiving videos, text messages, and honestly, those kinds of things are what keep me motivated in my profession. My profession is very satisfactory and I will never like to lose that. And that's why I continue um, seeing patients in the clinic. Um, and although I can do more um. I can do more paperwork or other kind of work such as supervision, which I also do. I supervise an amazing um, CF SLP here in California. But although I can do other duties because our profession let us do other duties, um, I decided to continue um, seeing my patients. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. I mean, your passion and love for your field really comes through and it really shows, you know, how much you care about what you're doing and the difference you're making. And like you said, you know, it is so powerful when you receive um, those text messages or videos. And even it just touched my heart as a mom, you know, to think of uh, the first words your child speaks or first time they do something. Uh, it's just beautiful. So you are able to do that to people and to children and to families. So <laughs> that's amazing that uh, you're able to have that impact. Is there anything else you would like to share with the audience before we wind up for the day? I just want to motivate them <laughs> to become an SLP and yes, um, to serve. More. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> Ascend is hiring SLPs right now. So if exactly. you want to yeah. <laughs> to become an SLP so you can make a differ the difference in a variety of individuals here in the United States um, and in a variety of individuals from different cultures and that speak different languages. It's so, so good to make a difference. It feels so good. This profession, as I already said it, it's very satisfactory. Um, so if you like sciences, communication, <laughs> if you like to work with kids or adults, because we also work with adults, um, just start doing a master's degree in speech language pathology um, and join Ascend if you're looking for, <laughs> for a place where you can make a difference. Um, join Ascend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Miss Ilya. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to the American uh, Speech and Hearing Association as well. And for uh, highlighting May as Better Hearing and Speech Month so we can all gather all our resources and really bring attention to this um, to this cause and help mm -hmm. more people. So thank you again for your time. And uh, um, you know where uh, you can find Ilya on her uh, Facebook page. And is there anything else you want to share, Ilya? No, just thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, and let's continue spreading the word about that, what speech language pathologies do. The, since sometimes people just think we work on speech sounds, we work on the R's and the S's, but no, 
<laughs> we are more than words. So yeah. let's continue spreading the words. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you everyone for joining us um, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.